Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening around the world. Welcome to day two of the Mautic Global Conference 2021. My name is David Shargell. I am the owner and manager of Wishhook, which is a boutique digital marketing agency. I, I hope you all found yesterday to be as fascinating and as interesting as, as I did. Matter of fact, I came away with a, a two very, very specific actionable things that I'm going to be implementing as soon as I get back from my holiday. Um, I, I, some of you know me, and I want to invite you all to join our meetup that is done once a month on the first Monday, I'm sorry, the first Tuesday of each month. There is a online uh, help desk that is hosted uh, by myself and Joey Keller. And we just invite people from all different types of questions, all different types of comments from beginner and novice questions up to intermediate. We even had some advanced expert questions that have come in there. So feel free to join in anytime to that uh, meetup.com Mautic help desk. Uh, today, I, I want to thank uh, you guys for coming here. Welcome to the the gathering, uh, once again, of the masters of this Mautic universe. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but it's now been exactly 75 months since the release of Mautic 1.0.0. And uh, congratulations on you guys being here and seeing Mautic through this near exponential growth we've been having. And people who are attending the session, and some of us are technologists, some of us are marketers, some of us are developers, uh, some of us work at agencies or are independent, uh, but we, we all provide services that uh, serve people who need what Mautic has to offer. I, I really believe that um, using our voice as marketers, using our voice as technologists is not just another job. Uh, one of the consistent things that I've always seen and is uh, truly coming out during this conference is that there's really a deeper passion uh, for what we do and, and also for how we do it. Uh, so I, I want you to know this, I'm inspired by all of you coming here and uh, celebrating uh, Mautic in 2021. Uh, I also wanna take a moment to thank um, not only uh, you guys, but also our partners, our speakers who are here, our current, past, and future uh, Mautic participants, and also want to thank our customers uh, for, uh, for allowing us to bring marketing automation to their front door. This idea of democratic funding is fascinating. It's uh, every contribution is, is a vote. Uh, regardless of the amount, it's considered to be a vote for a project under uh, this fund OSS. At the conclusion of the fund OSS campaign, the funds are gonna be distributed from a huge matching pool of 75,000 US dollars based on the frequency of donations that come in there. So the distribution is based mostly on the votes that they that come in rather than the value, the total value of the donations. Uh, this way, uh, the total match can be 10 times the amount of the contributions or even 100 times the amount of the individual contributions and donations that are being made. And what's happening is that there's a certain weight that is given to a project with the high frequency of contributions rather than a single large contributor that dominates that particular round of contributions into fund OSS. So I'm asking you guys today to please take a moment to jump over to the fund OSS landing page for Mautic Go ahead and make a contribution. It can be as little as $5. It can be $10, $20, or $100. Uh, please take a moment to make that contribution. The more contributions we get, the more money is going to go into the Mautic community. So I just want to impress upon you the importance of uh, activating this community once again, growing this community. And I want to take a moment to uh, hopefully have you understand that the most significant impact that you can have as an individual for the purpose of monetary contributions is to make that monetary contribution. So uh, please, this is your time to contribute in that monetary way. Uh, 
And today I've been joined by Ben Nichols. Uh, ben is the executive director and chief product officer at Open Collective, which is heading up this Fund OSS campaign. Uh, ben has been involved with open source for quite a while now, for many, many, many years. Uh, I don't know if you can recall Heartbleed. Uh, the Heartbleed, the Heartbleed bug was a fairly serious vulnerability in the popular uh, open SSL cryptographic software library. And shortly after the resolution started towards what was going on with the Heartbleed bug, uh, ben joined a small group of people who were asking themselves, well, what other projects uh, look like open SSL and what is it we can do to help those types of open source projects move forward in this world? Uh, today, open source is used in just about 70% of all internet connected uh, transactions and uh, um, interactions. So today, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Ben. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us here, and um, let's have a little little chat. Um, I had a couple of questions for you about uh, the Open Collective as well as the uh, Fund OSS uh, that uh, was recently put forth. And um, first, can you tell us a little bit about what Open Collective is? Yeah, um, so Open Collective helpfully is more than one thing. It's kind of a constellation of organizations. There's Open Collective Inc., which is a for-profit company that provides a platform. And that platform is used to transparently kind of uh, raise, manage, uh, spend money. And uh, Open Collective is also kind of known as Open Source Collective, which is a host organization that uses the Open Collective platform to support open source projects. You know, as, as we're going to hear multiple times during this conference there, it's now become easier to make financial contributions to Mautic. And uh, with uh, a new Open Source Collective, uh, Open Collective project, it makes it easier to get a, uh, a matching amount of sorts to it. Uh, I'm curious, um, you know, what is it that's going to convince the uh, the C-suite people in um, in enterprises that um, that software is here to stay? And separately, I'm curious on what do you think is holding back um, the free and open source software from keeping its big growth curve that it's currently been having? Um. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I need to convince the C-suite that open source software is here to kind of stay. I think we're pretty much at the point where we're all convinced that open source software is one. If you look at various kind of surveys that have been published by people like Black Dark, now Synopsis, I think, um, then you'll see that the growth and adoption of open source within industry and more generally has just got to the point where 99.9% .9 of the time, there'll be something open source that's in there. My boiler, which is a wood pellet boiler, has a notice on the inside of the instruction manual that talks about the open source components that are based in the boards that control the fire that it is working with. So literally open source software is keeping me safe and warm in my own home. Um, I think that the, the convincing that needs to be done is probably on what to contribute back to open source. And that's a part of what we're trying to do as Open Source Collective is we support open source projects, but we also try to engage these organizations in issues around kind of the sustainability of open source software and, and what and why they should contribute back. Um, I think what was the second part of your question was around uh, what's limiting open source software. Again, yeah. I I Sorry. mean, open source, you know, open source, uh, you know, we're talking about over 70% of the connected world being involved with open source in some way. But I'm curious on what do you think potentially can be holding it back from keeping its big growth curve that's experiencing? Is yeah, there anything that is really just making it, uh, you know, uh, more difficult as time goes on? Yeah, I, I think 100% the thing that's holding open source back, if anything, is money. And there's two issues with this. So the life cycle of an open source project kind of starts and it usually starts with like a software developer scratching their own itch as the cliche, right? And from that point, you kind of have this massive flame of implicit incentives to contribute. 
open source has been built on the basis that people are there to learn and to grow and to develop software collaboratively so they can build, you know, to a certain degree, a portfolio of things that they worked on, they can practice their craft and so on. And that is all just piling straight into the start and kind of mid kind of part of an open source project life cycle. But once you get to the kind of maturity level, the projects like OpenSSL and um, that TLS and so on are in, they're a much more kind of reactive kind of maintenance mode um, within the life cycle of that project. And a lot of those implicit kind of incentives to contribute go out the window. Like it's not really all that big and cool to say I spend six hours a month maintaining just updating the packages for you know, curl or something. It's, it's certainly less cool than saying, hey, I work on Vue.js, which is the new big thing in the JavaScript community. And I think we need to kind of look at money as being another explicit incentive to be able to kind of bring people into that process. And then there's one other aspect that I want to talk about, which is privilege. Uh, so I kind of feel like open source for a long time has basically been the domain of the privileged. We've been able to contribute to open source software because we have free time and we have free money. And I know because of my work with a project called Libraries.io, that open source software is predominantly the domain of white middle-class Americans and Europeans and all of the people that we would expect to see that kind of put into those privileged um, uh, cohorts. So I think money is another uh, massive kind of player in bringing the developing world and all of the diversity of perspectives and experience that those those people can kind of bring to open source. And I think that's just going to massively accelerate both the development of open source software and also the just general sustainability in terms of diversity and, and just people involved. It's just going to be amazing. Um, but we need to support those people coming in because they don't have those same freedoms often. And that is just a massive, massive issue. You know, you say that it's the domain of the privileged. I'm curious, uh, do you have a sense on how we're going to be bringing the developing world into the world of open source without paying for it? Well, this is the challenge. And I think this is why we need to start talking about money in open source. Um, we're working with groups in Africa. So we work with Open Source Community Africa with uh, one of the board members, uh, Samson Gotti, um, who is evangelizing participation in open source through a series of events. We support them through uh, spaces that we provide physically and virtually for them to talk about open source and projects that are accepting contributions. We work through them to be able to get people into projects like Season of Docs or, or uh, Summer of Code that's supported by Google. And I think we just generally need more programs like that, but we also need more general funding for open source. And I think what we need to do is kind of build an acceptance of money as an explicit motivated for contributing to open source, but also as a supportive kind of basis for people to enter and work with an open source that wouldn't otherwise be able to do so. And it's really on maintainers and those who are in kind of leadership positions in industry and in open source projects themselves to kind of wake up to that fact and to realize that there is a huge, huge potential in these people. Like where does the next generation of open source maintainers come from? It should be from Africa, should be from Asia, should be from all of these nations. And um, yeah, I just, I'm really excited about just a little, a little bit making that happen. So. Yeah. It's, it's not just the, the financial side, it's also the human side. And, and you know, you're, you're talking about sustainability. This is something that uh, we hear quite often in, in different fashions. And I think sustainability has kind of become a buzzword. You know, if I open up yet another magazine that talks about sustainable this and sustainable that, I feel like I'm just going to lose it kind of thing. You know, in, in, its, in its classic form, sustainability just simply means preserving things for future users, future, genera uh, future generations. Um, and I'm curious for the for the greater good for the entire uh, um, community at large with the open source world. Can you explain exactly what sustainability means to that greater good? Yeah, I think maybe we're a bit unfortunate that right now the world is kind of waking up in in various other domains to what sustainability means for that particular resource. Um, Sustainability in open source has been characterized in a number of ways that is based on kind of the perception of open source software as a public good, which 
I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that later on today. Uh, but also it kind of characterizes this tragedy of the commons kind of problem in which it's very difficult to, to manage a resource that is shared by so many people. Um, and that in doing so it is very difficult to organize um, even if you can agree that you need to manage that particular resource. Um, so I think for me, sustainability starts with the sustainability of an individual project, and it starts by thinking about resilience, and it starts by thinking about how a project can adapt to changes. And that might be changes in, in terms of usage, might be changes in terms of the landscape upon which it is built of like open source dependencies or within the kind of cases in which that project is being used. You know, we now have open source software on Mars. Who would have thought about that? Maybe that means that we need to think differently about that particular project and the cases in which it's been deployed. Um, and again, it means uh, resilience in terms of people. So what happens when core contributors leave? What happens when contribution comes down, usage goes up, we start to look at kind of the, the landscape of usage more as a kind of a stadium than, than as a kind of peer-to-peer -peer participation project. Um, and I think, honestly, sustainability for me within that context is about diversity. And I don't want to labor the point about people, but it, it includes diversity of people. It also includes diversity of sources of income. Um, one of the issues that we have a lot is, you know, someone kind of brings a big kind of wallet to the game and it's like, well, how much is that going to skew development? And it's just like, well, there are many different ways in which to financially support an open source project. And, you know, we're introducing, we hope, a, a new way for the future with Fund OSS, which we can talk a little bit about as well. Um, but ultimately, if we have a more diverse kind of set of ways in which we're supporting the work financially, it will offset a lot of those kind of motivations that someone with you know, that big wallet can kind of bring in. Um, the thing that's interesting for me, though, is about how potentially we need to move away from sustainability for the individual and think about sustainability for the commons and as open source as a community, because the potential to support a project financially uh, both in terms of like its exposure, its place in like the open source stack, whether it's a direct dependency of companies like, you know, Facebooks and Googles and so on, or whether it's one of these deeper dependencies like OpenSSL or TLS or curl even, um, that, that opportunity isn't equally distributed. But all of those opportunities are equally distributed across the whole of open source. So maybe we need to start moving towards a model where I think about open source as a commons and sharing all of those opportunities with one another in order to sustain the whole. I know that it's uh, only recently, uh, Fund OSS has only recently started, um, but I'm curious for people that uh, like me, when I went in and I was like, oh, I'm gonna make a contribution to Mautic specifically, I saw two other projects and I was like, oh, all right. One of which I knew about, which I'm gonna make a contribution for. And the other one that I just loved the little pitch that they were giving. Uh, have you found, in the, I know it's been fairly recent, but have you found that uh, people are doing something similar where they're discovering new projects that they maybe wouldn't have known about and making contributions to, towards that as well as what they went there to make the original contribution for? Yeah, very much. Um, and we built Fund OSS uh, with this in mind. So experience from Gitcoin Grants was the uh, average contributor to a project um, would normally support in actual fact, anywhere from like three to seven projects. And um, having spoken a little bit about how the opportunity to raise financial support for open source isn't equally distributed, this is something that we're really trying to lean in with Fund OSS because there do exist projects like Maltic that have somewhat of a halo effect um, and they kind of drag the center of gravity towards them in more traditional kind of match funds where it's a one-to-one -one or, or X to one kind of matching ratio, what you often see is those projects kind of sucking all the air out of the room. But in the knowledge that people using this kind of democratic funding method usually support more than one project, what we've done is kind of built this recommendation engine in and what we've done is uh, grouped projects that are in a similar domain or have a kind of similar uh, context um, so that that halo effect kind of establishes uh, groups of projects that are maybe less well known and that we can kind of share some of that opportunity through very simple interactions where we recommend projects if you're viewing Multic, say, or if you add it to your cart, maybe we'll recommend more projects. Or in fact, that we even have the concept of a cart where you can 
uh, kind of select a menu of projects that you want to support, check out and support those projects, and then share those projects as like your personal cart for others to be able to just add it to theirs and support as well. So yeah, it's all about kind of trying to share this opportunity, democratize the kind of distribution of funds within the, the matching uh, algorithm, and just generally trying to kind of bring more money and attention into the, the, the space. So. I spoke a little bit earlier about the uh, the starting pro- pilot project has matching amounts of uh, up to seventy five thousand U.S. dollars. I'm curious on how that money gets split apart amongst the uh, different monetary contributions. Can you speak towards that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I don't want to talk too much about mathematically how it works, but effectively there is an algorithm which has a fundamentally quadratic kind of distribution over the match fund and the uh, the participants in the actual funding campaign. So what we've done is raised $75,000 for this first round, um, which is two weeks long. And that fund comes from my organization, Open Source Collective, Open Collective Foundation, and Gitcoin, who have all put in um, about $25,000 each. Thank you very much. Um, And what we do is we allocate at the end of the round that fund according to the algorithm such that every contribution effectively has an equal vote. So instead of some person turning up with $10,000 and grabbing another $10,000 or $20,000 or $30,000 from the fund, what you have is people voting on every single contribution with an equal amount of weight. Basically, the TLDR of all of this is, is... in the following example, where you have $1,000 and you have two projects and you have one project that raises $10 from one person and you have another project that raises $10 from 10 people, you'll find over 90% of that $1,000 match fund goes to the project with the 10 funders rather than the project with a single funder, which is why we're kind of calling it democratic funding, is that it's more about kind of the, the vote than it is the weight of uh, contributions that are made during the campaign. It's exciting. Um, I, uh, I'm looking forward to its success here. And um, I hope that everybody here also makes um, some type of monetary contribution uh, via Fund OSS. Uh, from Open Collective standpoint, getting back to this, uh, Open Collective as a, an organization, um, I'm curious, uh, Mautic has gotten to the point, specifically Mautic has gotten to the point where now not a small growing community, but a larger mid-tier, you know, an expanding community. Uh, how does Open Collective help a group like Mautic, um, our community? Yeah, so I think there's there's a couple of things. And again, it's you know, trying to a small degree to distinguish uh, between Open Collective as a platform and Open Source Collective as a host organization. So Open Collective as a platform is only really opinionated about a couple of things and that's kind of community and transparency. Um, I think Open Source Collective inherits that opinionated um, kind of technology by default and we're very grateful too because personally and professionally, I agree that uh, community and, and transparency within communities is the way to kind of build open source software. Not really a fan of the benevolent dictator kind of model. Um, But yeah, I think, Open Collective is there to ease uh, the transition from working as a smaller group of core contributors to working as a more kind of dispersed, nebulous kind of group of contributors and maintainers, and to be able to use money as a tool uh, to be able to accelerate development and to be able to do a hell of a lot more within the community than just developing software, right? So. Open Collective supports events, supports you know little projects so that if you want to, you can raise funds for particular projects or you can spend funds in particular projects as well. It's a relatively new feature. Um, and then over the top of all of that, we have Open Source Collective, which exists to support and financially uh, provide a service called Fiscal Sponsorship in which we are effectively the host of the project when it comes to legal issues and when it comes to 
tax and when it comes to holding funds. Um, but also we are here to offer the human support to maintainers and contributors, members of that community to go through the experience of building that community and establishing a governance framework and just being there to kind of offer support and services that often don't make sense for individual uh, open source projects, um, but do make sense as a collection of open source projects and a community of open source more generally to kind of share those kind of resources. So maybe that when that comes to kind of copywriting or when it comes to management or so on, what we want to do is kind of build a basis, a foundation of support uh, for all member projects as well. And then on top of that, we also have conversations like this and projects that we're running like Fund OSS and Contributor Funds and Sustain, which is a group of meetings that are predominantly kind of research and um, kind of high level kind of thinking around the problem space and understanding it and developing uh, an understanding with industry and academia about, you know, this public goods uh, failure of the, the commons and, and, um, and basic economics. So yeah, we're also trying to kind of build the, the basis of understanding that will down the road help us solve some of these issues as well. And um, talking about down the road, uh, only a few months ago in early uh, 2021, you became executive director of the organization. Uh, is there any specific directions you want to take it in the upcoming years? Yeah, I think um, for me personally, I will say, number one, uh, I've been in this job now for, I think, nearly three months. Um, I've been a board member for the last three and a half years, so I come in with a lot of context. Um, and I've inherited a very successful organization. Um, we have like at least double the amount of funds that we have for member projects on a yearly basis to the point that, you know, we're getting to the, the tens of millions now, most likely for this year. Um, but what I want to see is more projects spending. Um, so really over the course of this year and next, I want to really encourage projects to think about how they can use money as an explicit kind of incentive for people to contribute to projects, maybe to even bring other more kind of diverse perspectives into their project from design, from copywriting, from, hey, even, you know, marketers and so on. This community is particularly special, I think, because there are many people with a set of skills that don't exist more broadly in open source. Um, and then the other thing is that we're just kind of looking at our place in the universe. So like five years ago, there were very few maintainers that were doing things to sustain their work financially. And if they were, they were either under the banner of bigger kind of organizations or foundations. And now we've kind of, I don't want to say democratized too much, but effectively democratized uh, to a degree, the ways in which you can financially kind of support your open source project. Um, and really what we need to do is kind of take a look like five years in, where does open source collective fit into that picture? It, are we there to incubate projects that come in with very little in terms of understanding where they are with governance and how they want to kind of build their project? Or do we need to come in at the other end where projects are so big that they've actually kind of gone through all of that thinking and really what they want is kind of a hands-off kind of um, uh, partner to be able to handle a lot of the kind of legal accounting tax and finance kind of issues. Um, but yeah, I haven't decided which of the, the realms we're in just yet. I mean, experience has taken us from very small projects and then we're kind of building up. So I imagine that might be the direction that we go in, but there's some scope for the other side there as well. So Ben, thank you again very, very much. And uh, I hope you have a most wonderful day there. That was great. Thank you very much. Ben has an interesting insight into what the future of open source looks like, especially from a legal, a financial and a, a sustainability point. Uh, I want to take a moment today while we have just a couple of minutes remaining in this morning session, and again, sorry for the technical difficulties there, just to talk about what's on tap for today. Immediately following this conversation, there's going to be a, um, a discussion on a beginner's guide to using Mautic. Uh, this is going to be something that's going to be covering not only basics, but getting into just getting your hands right into the meat of things there. So. I strongly recommend that. If you're really, really technical and you've been wondering a little bit about how uh, emails work, 
especially within um, uh, Amazon AWS SES, uh, join us over in room three in this morning. There's actually a couple of other sessions that I am personally looking forward to. Um, we're going to have Ben back here. Ben is going to be appearing at uh, 1500 hours, that's UTC time. Um, and he's going to be just talking about open source sustainability uh, of the commons as an entire community, as opposed to just Mautic as its own community there. Uh, that's something that's going to be really, really fascinating. And definitely don't uh, don't miss uh, the, the meetup, uh, the, the Mauticon keynote that's going to be taking place at uh, 1800 hours. So I invite you back. There's uh, some wonderful uh, something on lead scoring taking place later on. Uh, there's also something that's going to be discussing uh, frameworks, uh, how you go about structuring uh, everything, and separately another conversation just about how to get your reporting out of Mautic and uh, into Metabase. Uh, a number of people are using external systems to read into uh, into Mautic and produce uh, better reports than you can actually do from within Mautic. And I'd like to also make sure that everybody understands there is an entirely separate room, which is the international room, where today there's going to be presentations that are being done in German, uh, I believe Brazilian as well, uh, uh, Portuguese as well, uh, for our Brazilian uh, and uh, Portuguese, uh, Portuguese guests. So feel free to jump over into the international room. And the last room I want to mention, as we're just a couple of minutes away from a countdown here, uh, getting about five minutes into the sessions, is our community council panel. And I just want to draw attention to, uh, this is an annual event where we have a number of people who participate specifically in the leadership roles in the, our community. And uh, what I want to do is I want to invite you all to submit questions to this group. So please send any types of questions. They can be anonymous if you want to, or you can attach your name to them. I'm going to ask you to send those questions to me at my own email address. I'll be monitoring it, and I'll be sure to, as the moderator, to ask those questions of the group. Now, the the, the Mountain Community Council panel is going to be starting at 1,300 hours. Uh, that is ETC time. And when you have any kind of questions that you want to ask of the group, please send them to me. My email address is david at wishhook dot com that is d a v i d at w i s h h o o k dot com so please uh go ahead and uh, get those questions in there we'd love to have you and uh i'm gonna drop off over here i'm gonna be heading over to track three in just a couple of moments and over on track three there's going to be a conversation uh, specifically on Amazon AWS uh, for email sends with Muhammad Abu Mosa. And I uh, hope to see all of you guys over there in the other track in just a couple of moments. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are around the world. And thanks for joining uh, us on day two of the Mountic Global Conference.